Thank you all for coming to this year's Legal Legends Luncheon. In 1932, when the country was in the throes of the Great Depression, Franklin Delano Roosevelt once said, the country needs, and unless I mistake its temper, the country demands bold, persistent experimentation. It is common sense to take a method and try it. If it fails, admit it frankly and try another, but above all, try something. He was talking about reestablishing an independent Federal Reserve Bank, but this pragmatic approach to governance can be seen throughout his long presidency. For example, when a rogue Supreme Court began invalidating all New Deal legislation, FDR devised a plan to expand the court. At the time, the American public was viscerally against court reform. Perhaps they feared abandoning tradition. Perhaps they simply didn't understand the type of relief that the court was blocking, having never had the opportunity to benefit from it. However, though FDR ultimately failed in passing court reform, notably, the court also changed course and stopped striking down his legislation. Ultimately, FDR's willingness to try something did allow him to push through the remainder of his New Deal which to this day continues to provide for and protect the American people. It has been said that history doesn't repeat, but that it does rhyme. We are confronted today with a rogue Supreme Court that no longer considers public sentiment, public health, or even its own precedence. Now that both Roe and Casey have been overturned, people are experiencing the brutal loss of their civil rights directly and cruelly but they aren't standing by quietly. A recent study shows young women in key states are registering to vote at record levels, and the impact of this has not yet been fully realized. Other polling shows that the public's confidence in the Supreme Court has reached an historic low, while their willingness to explore new configurations of the court has been awakened. The opportunity for meaningful Supreme Court reform is ripe. ACS has been a strong voice for calling for judicial reform, and it continues its work on protecting reproductive rights at all levels of government. In the last few weeks, ACS President Russ Feingold has been loudly calling for the Senate to quickly fill critical vacancies in federal courts. We ask today that you consider ways that you can help advance this important work. ACS has over 200 active student and lawyer chapters focused on building networks and providing important educational opportunities to shape the debate on the most critical issues facing the country. If you aren't already a member of ACS, we encourage you to join today. And we still have open positions on the ACS Chicago Chapter Board of Directors, so we encourage all of those who are interested in serving to apply. We hope you will join us in service and through your financial support to ensure that ACS's important work can continue. Today, we are proud to recognize five incredible honorees who have each done their part to support ACS's central tenet, namely that the law should be a force to improve the lives of all people, not just the privileged few who can afford it. This afternoon, we honor Margaret Benson, Linda Coberly, Aziz Huck, Mary Smith, and Alexa Van Brunt. From the academy, to legal aid services, to private practice, these individuals represent the best of ACS, and we are thrilled to be celebrating them today. We are also proud to welcome back our keynote speaker, Camilla Taylor, past recipient of the Ruth Goldman Award and fierce advocate for the due process precedents that have protected women and the LGBTQ plus community for decades. ACS Chicago invites you to hear her words and think collectively about those bold new strategies that can combat a rogue court and preserve our most precious civil liberties. Before we begin, I'd like to thank the members of our luncheon committee, Dan Cotter, Jerry Brown, Juan Thomas, and Lauren Dana for their time and endless support. I would also like to thank our friends at ACS National, Peggy Lee, Megan Paulus, Emily Thompson, Tanya Davila, and Jordan Guillen for their seemingly endless energy and positive outlook. 
A lot of work goes into planning this event, and these folks behind the scenes work joyfully and tirelessly to make this happen each year. A special thanks must go out to them. As we gather here today, I see so many friends' names tuned in. I want to acknowledge one person whom we surely miss, Ron Miller. Ron passed away last September and was such a key part of the Chicago progressive legal community. Among the many causes he championed, he served on our chapter's board of advisors and helped our chapter organize its first luncheon. As we gather today for our 17th luncheon, we remember Ron Miller and the legacy he leaves. And finally, I would especially like to express our gratitude to our MC and longtime friend, Jeff Stone, who each year leads us through not only the luncheon, but provides our chapter with valuable insight and leadership whenever we ask. Jeff is currently the Edward H. Levi Distinguished Service Professor at the University of Chicago Law School. He is one of the nation's finest First Amendment scholars and an invaluable friend to the American Constitution Society, where he serves as co-chair of the Chicago Lawyer Chapter Board of Advisors. He is also a former chair of the ACS National Board of Directors. And of course, he has also been a teacher, mentor, and friend to many in our audience today. As you can see, we have many fine voices and many fine examples of service to celebrate today. On behalf of the ACS Chicago Board of Directors, I thank you all for joining us this afternoon. And now let us commence with our celebration. Thank you, Rebecca. That was a wonderful, truly wonderful introduction, um, not just for me, but for the event itself. Um, so the American Constitution Society was founded in 2001 to promote the vitality of the US Constitution and the fundamental values it expresses. Individual rights and liberties, equality, access to justice, democracy, and the rule of law. Now here's a line that I have said during the last five Legal Legends luncheons, but each year it just gets worse. Quote, we now face the greatest challenge to ACS's core values in living memory. When ACS was founded, we had what we then thought was a dangerously conservative Supreme Court. Seven of the nine justices had been appointed by Republican presidents, and the court had just decided Bush v. Gore. But now as we look to the future, we see a Supreme Court that includes Clarence Thomas, John Roberts, Samuel Alito, Neil Gorsuch, Brett Kavanaugh, and Amy Coney Barrett. We now live in a world with an ever increasingly rock solid majority of arch conservative justices who make the quote conservative court of 2001 look moderate. This is of course true across a range of critical issues, including voting, campaign finance reform, religion, guns, equality, and criminal justice. The most obvious example though, is what this court did to Roe v. Wade just a few months ago. From 1973 to the present, nine of the 11 Republican appointed justices voted to uphold a woman's right to determine her own destiny. But in Dobbs, five Republican appointed justices voted to overrule Roe. That's just one example of the extraordinary political and religious distortion of the current Supreme Court. At this moment and into the future, our nation needs the American Constitution Society more than ever. We need to stand up for a principled understanding of our Constitution, one that protects the rights of women, that protects the rights of gays and lesbians and transgender persons, that protects the rights of Blacks, Latinx, Native Americans, and other discriminated against minorities, that protects the rights of persons accused of crime, and that protects the right to vote and the democratic liberties of our people, of all of our people. This is a fight we must fight now and in the future. And I can promise you that ACS will help us fight that fight aggressively, courageously, and boldly for ourselves, for our children, and for our children's children. We must do that thoughtfully and with passion. And that is why we are here today. 
But now it is time for me to take a deep breath, clear my head, pass beyond my anger, and thank those organizations that have played a critical role in sponsoring this event. ACS is deeply grateful to Jenner and Block, Sidley and Austin, Winston and Strawn, Fager, Dinker, Biddle, and Reith, you so-called peers Resnick and Dim, Mayor Brown, Levin and Perconti, and the Prince Law Firm. We thank each of you for your generous and essential support. You are truly wonderful. And now it is time for us to turn to the energizing privilege of recognizing those members of the Chicago legal community who we honor today. First, it is my great privilege to present our 2022 Ruth Goldman Awards. Ruth Goldman worked in legal aid through most of her career, and she played a pivotal role in the founding of our ACS chapter in Chicago. Ruth died in 2008 at the age of 87, months after seeing the award in her name established. The Ruth Goldman Award is designed both to celebrate the achievements of women leaders of the Chicago legal community and to encourage women lawyers to champion the ideals of ACS. It is my great honor to present our 22 Ruth Goldman Award to two amazing women, Alexa Von Brandt and Linda Koberly. Alexa received her law degree from Stanford in 2009. She is a renowned civil liberties lit litigator who currently serves as director of both the Illinois Office of the MacArthur Justice Center and of the MacArthur Civil Rights Litigation Clinic at Northwestern. In collaboration with civil rights advocates and grassroots organizations, Alexa uses litigation to push for de-incarceration, racial and economic justice, and transformation of the criminal legal system. Through litigation, Alexa seeks to promote accountability and transparency within the cr criminal legal system, in police stations, jails, and prisons that lack judicial and public oversight, and where officials are often permitted to act with impunity. Here are just a few examples of her many accomplishments. This past winter, Alexa and her colleagues obtained a preliminary injunction against the Florida Department of Corrections on behalf of a mentally ill man who'd been held in solitary confinement for more than five years. The court ordered the individual to be removed from solitary confinement and released into the general population, a rare victory in cases of this type. In 2020, during the community uprising, Following the murder of George Floyd, Alexa filed a state mandamus petition against the city of Chicago for its ongoing failure to provide people in police stations with access to counsel in violation of Illinois law. In another series of cases, Alexa spearheaded challenges to Illinois' parole replication system, obtaining a right to state funded counsel and procedural protections for both adults and youth facing parole revocation in Illinois. And to cite this one more example, Alexa recently settled a suit for more than $14 million for an individual who had served more than 20 years in prison after he was forced by CPD detectives to confess as a 70-year-old to a double homicide he could not have committed because he was in police custody on a minor charge at the time of the crime. As a recent graduate of Northwestern has said about Alexa, the work she does is not easy, and it is often emotionally grueling. She has shown me how to make space for clients and families impacted by police brutality and other abuses. And she has shown me what my future can be. Alexa, congratulations on winning the American Constitution Society's 2022 Ruth Goldman Award. You are indeed a hero. Thank you so much, Jeff, for those incredibly kind words. Thank you to the Chicago Lawyers Chapter of the American Constitution Society for this significant honor. I'm so grateful to be here among this distinguished group of advocates who are committed to pushing for justice and light in these challenging times. I'd like to thank my spouse, Josh Coleman, my two children, Sebastian and Helena, and the other members of my family, some of whom are watching. Their support has meant so much to me throughout my entire career. I also want to express appreciation for my colleagues at the MacArthur Justice Center, including those who nominated me for this award, David Shapiro, Nora Terabishi, Sophia Arelo, and Amir Ali. I would not be here, certainly, without the singular group of people at MacArthur, a rock star team of advocates who are also incredibly kind, down-to-earth humans, 
and I'm inspired by them every day. It has been an absolute pleasure working at that organization for the past 12 years. As Jeff mentioned, I wear dual hats. I'm both a litigator and a clinical and professor. The first as litigator was a job I always knew I wanted to pursue since law school. Litigation seems to run in my blood. Bringing civil rights suits with clients who are committed to challenging corrupt, racist, and unjust practices in the criminal system, in spite of the many, many hardships these cases bring to their lives, it's what motivates me, what helps get me up in the morning and keeps me going sometimes late at night. Many of our clients at MacArthur are themselves very skilled organizers, activists, and strategic planners. And often the litigation we bring with them is only one part of a larger campaign to affect social change. I'm so privileged to have the opportunity to be part of these bigger fights. And working with our clients and other legal partners, all of those cases Jeff mentioned were done in, in collaboration with a fabulous and very talented civil rights attorneys in Chicago. And with our clients and partners, we challenge the worst abuses in the criminal legal system. As you heard from the degradation of solitary confinement to systemic violence by law enforcement officers and prison guards to widespread racial and economic discrimination in policing, pretrial detention, sentencing, and post-trial supervision. Having a small role in pushing to transform a system that intentionally treats human beings as less than human is a job I will never, ever take for granted. But I'd also like to talk here about my second job as clinical instructor, which is one I came into somewhat more accidentally. In 2010, having just moved to Chicago, a year out of law school, I was on the job hunt for that ever elusive position of entry level civil rights attorney. Maybe others in this uh, session can relate to that. Locke Bowman, former executive director of MacArthur, former legal legend from this organization, took a chance hired me, trained me up as a civil rights attorney. MacArthur was based at the Bloom Legal Clinic at Northwestern Law School, so I was based there too. In the last decade, working with my truly wonderful colleagues and clinicians at Bloom, I have learned how to become an effective teacher, supervisor, mentor, and of course, redliner. But above all, I believe I have learned how to use how to give young attorneys the opportunity to hone their advocacy skills while using their privilege as lawyers to promote social justice. And this is not a job I foresaw back in law school, but it is one that I now deeply cherish. If litigation is what gets me up every day and going, working with and mentoring others in the legal field is what brings, joys, brings joy to my days. The Ruth Goldman Award honors a person who has made significant contributions to the state of women in the legal profession and the goals of ACS. To the extent I have done any of this, it is because I've had the unique opportunity to collaborate with an extraordinary group of students, legal professionals, fellows, and attorneys over the years. I'm so grateful for this award. Thank you so much. Thank you, Alexa, that was wonderful, lovely remarks. Um, our second Ruth Goldman Award winner, Linda Coberly, earned her law degree in 1995 from the University of Michigan, after which she served as a law clerk to Supreme Court Justice Stephen Breyer. Linda is a partner at Winston and Strawn, where she leads the firm's appellate and critical motions practice. She counsels clients on appellate and strategic issues at all stages of litigation, from before trial to proceedings before the Supreme Court. Linda has argued more than 50 appeals spanning eight different federal courts of appeal, and she recently led the briefing in a 9-0 victory in the Supreme Court for a class of student athletes in their challenge to the NCAA's amateurism rules. Linda's achievements have not gone unnoticed. She's repeatedly been recognized as one of the nation's top appellate lawyers but her energy does not stop there. Linda is especially proud of her work in advocating for the Equal Rights Amendment. In 2017, she began working with activists in Illinois to advocate for ratification of the ERA after the proposed amendment 
had failed at Illinois many years ago. She led teach-ins for activists and legislators and drafted materials for use in the lobbying efforts. In all of this, Linda was successful as Illinois finally ratified the ERA in the spring of 2018. Shortly after that victory, Linda got the attention of the National ERA Coalition, and she began working with that organization to achieve national ratification. She was appointed chair of the coalition's legal task force and now serves on its board. On top of all that, Linda has worked to coordinate and to file briefs on behalf of more than 50 organizations in support of the women's and LGBTQ rights movements. In Chicago, Linda is a past chair of the Heartland Alliance, the largest human rights organization in the Midwest, and she recently chaired the Chicago Bar Foundation's Investing in Justice campaign. In recognition of her pro bono work in the areas of immigration justice and human rights, Linda has received the 2018 Edward J. Lewis Pro Bono Service Award from the Chicago Bar Association and the 2014 Human Rights Practitioner Award from the National Immig Immigrant Justice Center. Linda has shared with me, by the way, that the most terrifying moment in her life was when at the DC Shakespeare Theater, she argued before a panel of Supreme Court justices, including Breyer, for whom she clerked, Kagan, and Sotomayor, in defense of Mordred for his alleged murder of King Arthur, during which Justice Breyer began raging at her in French. Linda, you are terrific, and I am honored to present you with this year's Ruth Goldman Award. La parole est à vous. <laughs> thank you so much, uh, Professor Stone. Um, and thank you to the uh, Constitution Society for this amazing award. It is such an honor to receive this award and particularly award, an award named for someone like Ruth Goldman who uh, devoted her life to public service and particularly to the rights of women. Um, I also want to thank uh, ACS member Michelle Thorne for nominating for me for this award. Um, Michelle is a great advocate for the ERA herself, and it's been such a pleasure to work with her. Um, I want to thank my family, who is frequently telling me that I have too many jobs, uh, but endlessly supports me, including by, be, by being on this uh, Zoom today. And I want to thank my firm, Winston & Strawn, uh, that has given me so many opportunities and really has given me very broad berth in using the power of the firm to advocate for uh, sex equality. It's a tremendous honor to be here today and to be honored along with these uh, amazing lawyers. I feel lucky every day I get to be a lawyer. Uh, I've been able to work on so many fascinating issues from the rights of college athletes to the fair distribution of organs for transplantation to protecting the interests of companies that employ good people and make good products. But the most meaningful work I've been able to do in my career has been pro bono. I'm sure many of you on this call feel that way, those of you who work in private practice. And, uh, and in particular, the most meaningful work I've been able to do is in advancing the rights of immigrants and in advocating for constitutional equality through the Equal Rights Amendment. You know, when I started working on this issue, um, what I heard frequently was, why do we still need it? We have constitutional protection for reproductive rights. We have federal, state, and local laws that protect the rights of women. And we all know that the late Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg was able to secure constitutional protections under the 14th Amendment, both in her work as an advocate and later as a justice on the Supreme Court. But here we are. We've all read the Dobbs decision. And for obvious reasons, the need for constitutional equality is greater today than it was, I think, even in 1972 when the ERA passed. Now, I'm a realist, and I actually don't think, unfortunately, that an equal rights amendment would change the minds of our current Supreme Court about reproductive freedom. But what the Dobbs decision tells us in really clear terms is that this is a court that is not interested in inference or the traditional principles of, of uh, interpreting the Constitution aside from its plain text. This is a court that is going to view the 14th Amendment solely through its words as interpreted by legislature, legislators 
1868. Now, for women, of course, women's rights weren't even on the table uh, at that time. Women didn't have even a federally protected right to vote. And of course, there's no reason to think that any legislator in 1868 had in mind the rights of LGBTQ people. So we need to put them in the Constitution. This court is telling us that the only way to protect critical rights is through text. So we need to change the text to protect against discrimination on the basis of sex. And until that happens, fortunately, those of us interested in protecting those rights need to be focused on legislatures because that's where the protections and the incursions are happening now. That's an uphill battle, of course, especially given the incursions on voting rights. Uh, but it's where our attention is so is so intensely needed, and there and on the long, longer term goal of amending the Constitution and restoring sensible interpretation to our Supreme Court. So I, I want to end by thanking again the American Constitution Society for this amazing honor. I'm really humbled to be here today and to receive this award. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was wonderful, Linda. Um, and you are wonderful, I should say, as well. Um, it's now my great honor to introduce this afternoon's keynote speaker, a person I greatly admire, Camilla Taylor. After earning her JD from Columbia, Camilla was a staff attorney with the Criminal Appeals Bureau of the Legal Aid Society of New York City. Camilla now serves as the litigation director for Lambda Legal the oldest and largest national legal organization committed to achieving full recognition of the civil rights of lesbians, gay men, bisexuals, transgender people, and people with HIV. In this role, she has led endless litigation across the nation to support these rights, including one case in which middle school tra transgender students had been blocked from joining their schools cross country and golf teams. Another in which Lambda Legal filed suit against a Florida law coined, don't say gay or trans, which chilled LGBTQ students from coming out and from speaking with pride about their LGBTQ friends and family members. An illegal victory establishing that employers and businesses may not discriminate against transgender people by denying them access to the restroom that matches their gender identity. During the Trump years, Camilla spearheaded Lambda Legal's many challenges the federal regulations and executive orders that targeted the LGBTQ community, including the Trump administration's ban on military service by transgender people. From 2011 through 2015, Camilla was project director of Lambda Legal's National Marriage Project, which played an instrumental role in bringing about the Supreme Court's decision in Obergefell versus Hodges. In addition to her work as a litigator, Camilla has contributed to legislative efforts concerning marriage and parenting across the nation, and she has testified many times before state legislatures in support of marriage bills and in opposition to me measures that would permit discrimination against lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people. And on top of all that, Camilla has taught LGBTQ law at both the University of Chicago Law School and Northwestern, and she serves in the American Constitution Society's Chicago Board of Advisors. Moreover, I should say that 10 years ago, I had the honor of awarding the ACS Ruth Goldman Award to Camilla. Camilla, up and at him. Thanks so much, Jeff, for the overly kind um, introduction. And I am just uh, thrilled to be able to celebrate with all of you the gifts and accomplishments of our honorees this afternoon. These are leading lights in legal scholarship, advocacy, and social justice. They have taken a stand against the destruction of our democracy. They've transformed the criminal legal system. They have vindicated student athletes and women's rights. They have provided representation to countless families in need, and they have championed justice for Native American communities. They inspire us by demonstrating what can be achieved through belief in the rule of law at a particularly perilous time for our nation, when it has become clear that we cannot take the rule of law for granted. 
I thought I'd begin by addressing the various atrocities that happened at the end of the last Supreme Court term, uh, in part because it's hard to talk about anything else, and in part to address the nagging voice that I suspect we all hear from time to time ever since, which says, why did I get a law degree again? What is the point? Does anything even matter? And of course, the very existence of our honorees and the example of their work provides the most potent answer to that nagging voice. But another answer is that it has never been more important to be a lawyer, to stand up and to advocate for the rule of law. So what happened at the end of the term? The court delivered a series of cynical and le legally unsound decisions that upended long settled precedents heedless of the harmful impacts on the American people, eliminating and threatening fundamental personal rights at the core of the liberty and equality guarantees of the Constitution. To justify this, the court used a novel and nonsensical mode of analysis that limits essential rights exclusively to those rights that were recognized and enjoyed by people who had full legal status a century or two ago. In other words, by people who were not women, people of color or LGBTQ among others, and to discern which rights were recognized a century or two ago, the court adopted a flawed and misleading version of American history. By consequence, many of this term's constitutional cases appeared to be not so much a battle between legal advocates, but more a battle between historians. And even the historians didn't get a fair shake as the court's selective cherry picking of history and misrepresentations of historical events and laws drew a rebuke from the nation's preeminent historians associations. So for example, in Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health, the court reversed Roe versus Wade and Planned Parenthood versus Casey. And in doing so, it, it was interpreting the liberty guarantee of the constitution's due process clauses. Uh, and the court chose the latter half of the 19th century instead of 1791, when the framers first included such a clause in the Fifth Amendment. And then the court ignored the overwhelming evidence of the long legal tradition extending from the common law to the late 1800s of laws permitting abortion until the point of a pregnancy when fetal movement can be detected, known as quickening. And this allowed the court to justify eliminating a fundamental liberty from a class of people, ignoring the Constitution's equal protection command. And although the court claimed that there would be no necessary implications for other rights, such as the right to form a relationship with or marry a person of the same sex, those assurances ring hollow. Justice Thomas in a concurrence in Dobbs flat out called for overruling Lawrence versus Texas and Obergefell versus Hodges as illegitimate offspring of Roe and Casey. And remember that justices Thomas and Alito and Roberts all dissented in Obergefell. And Justice Alito joined uh, Justice Thomas's anti-Obergefell statement in a case concerning Kim Davis, who was a government official who claimed a religious right not to issue marriage licenses to same-sex couples. And in this statement, both Justice Thomas and Justice Alito called for overruling Obergefell, but um, simply uh, concurred in denying cert because it wasn't a clean enough vehicle in which to do, to do that. And as Linda just pointed out, uh, the court also peppered the Dobbs decision with language that calls into question even the heightened scrutiny that the court currently applies under the Equal Protection Guarantee for um, classifications based on sex, for sex discrimination. Additionally, the Dobbs decision drips with smug self-righteousness without recognition of the pain that it inflicts. As a result of this decision, many people will suffer, some will die. Patients, including children already, are being denied medically necessary care. Some are being prosecuted. Interstate chaos is happening as states attempting to restrict abortion try to claw the right even from people in states where abortion remains protected. The court committed similar errors of analysis and of consequence in other cases as well this term. For example, in New York State Pistol and Rifle Association versus Bruin, the court purported to examine the historical context and meaning of the Second Amendment all in service of a new test that asks whether a firearms regulation is part of a historical tradition. The test looks only at the regulation itself without regard to how firearms have evolved since the 1700s. And even then the court was still forced to acknowledge that equivalent historical regulations existed that were comparable to the more than century old regulation that was at issue in this case. 
But the court dismissed the existence of these regulations because they existed in rural states and territories on the theory that not many people probably lived there. Without irony, the court declared that, quote, not all history is created equal. In the past, the court has avoided these errors because up until recently it understood that the original founders and those who adopted the Reconstruction Amendments drafted broad protective principles into the Constitution so that it would remain relevant for future generations, not an anachronism frozen in time. They sought to safeguard the rights and freedoms of all over time, not just the original powerful few. But ignoring these lessons, the court did similar damage this term to the establishment clause. It required taxpayer funding of religious education and it approved of religious worship activity by a public school official on school grounds while in his official role as a football coach. The court undermined Miranda rules. It limited death row prisoners' ability to challenge unconstitutional state court convictions. It restricted prisoners' ability to present ineffective assistance of counsel claims. The court also constricted the doctrine that has allowed people injured during violation of their constitutional rights by government agents to recover compensation, deeming court recognition of such rights, quote, a disfavored judicial activity. The court blocked lower federal court orders that had directed the Louisiana legislature to revise its new congressional maps due to probable violation of the Voting Rights Act, meaning that the evidently discriminatory maps very likely will remain in place until 2023. And it erased the authority of the Environmental Protection Agency under the Clean Air Act to develop certain limits on power plants' carbon dioxide emissions. And this is just a partial list of the damaging decisions issued this term. This term's decisions have eroded public confidence in the integrity of the court, particularly when overlaid against the broken process that got us here. The manipulation of the Senate confirmation process to stack the court to achieve, to achieve precisely these outcomes, incomplete investigations and intentionally misleading assurances by, by nominees, and the specter of justices refusing to recuse in situations presenting blatant conflicts of interest. But here's the good news. Abortion opponents must feel as though they are the proverbial dog that caught the car. They have misjudged the degree to which their overreach would spur outrage and backlash, as the recent referendum outcome in Kansas demonstrates. And we as litigators um, who, who do civil rights litigation have been here before. We have faced federal courts hostile to civil liberties and that misconstrue the Constitution and we know what to do. To cite just one example from the LGBT civil rights movement, which is most familiar to me, we remember when the court ruled in 1986 in Bowers versus Hardwick that it would be, quote, facetious to suggest a fundamental right to homosexual sodomy. LGBT civil rights litigants then fought in state courts under state constitutions and emphasized distinct federal constitutional protections such as equality before returning to an enlightened United States Supreme Court in Lawrence versus Texas in 2003 to vindicate the right of same-sex couples to love each other. We did the same with the fight for marriage equality. There are similar opportunities available to us today in many of the fights ahead of us, whether it's the free speech arguments that are available to Florida youth that um, Jeff mentioned in school who were told that they can't be open about who they are, there are procedural arguments available even in state courts such as Texas, which have allowed us to halt some of the most vicious attacks on transgender young people. But here's the key. To address the United States Supreme Court's loss of legitimacy, its flouting of precedent and norms, and its threat to the rule of law itself, we need court reform. Over the last year and a half, the American Constitution Society has made repeated calls for court reform, including a number of reforms to the Supreme Court itself, such as adding seats to the Supreme Court and creating a binding code of ethics for Supreme Court justices. I point you to ACS President Russ Feingold's statement uh, issued October 2021 titled, This is why ACS is calling for urgent and specific Supreme Court reforms for details on ACS's positions. We at Lambda Legal engaged in a similar internal conversation about the need for court reform, but it wasn't until the end of the last term that we issued our own statement together with our sister LGBT impact litigation organizations, the National Center for Lesbian Rights and GLAAD. 
We agonized as lawyers um, who are often before the Supreme Court about whether explicit recognition of the Supreme Court's loss of legitimacy and threat to the rule of law would impact our cases. We worried about the appearance of sour grapes with respect to the outcomes of certain cases, but we concluded that we had no choice but to take a stand and to call out the court's lack of integrity, because if we failed to do so, we become complicit and we have no chance of obtaining the reform that is so badly needed. ACS arrived on time to this conclusion and we were late. Many impact litigation organizations have yet to join us in calling for these reforms. But if the best time to identify the need for reform is when ACS did it, the second best time is surely any time after that. We specifically called on Congress to take the following minimal essential steps. Lift the filibuster, at least to allow Senate consideration of Supreme Court reform and voting rights restoration. Pass the Judiciary Act of 2021 to expand the number of seats on the court to equal the number of circuits in the federal judiciary. Pass the For the People Act of 2021, the John R. Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act of 2021, and the Washington DC Admission Act. And finally, adopt an enforceable ethics code for the Supreme Court. It has never been a more important time to be a lawyer and to stand up for the rule of law. I hope all of you join ACS if you have not already. I see that Peggy has put the link in the chat. And I hope that you will make a similar call for court reform, including US Supreme Court expansion and democracy restoration. This is long-term essential cross-movement work. Thanks so much for the honor of joining you this afternoon and congratulations to the amazing honoree. Thank you, Camilla, for those really thoughtful and motivating remarks and particularly your marvelous statement about judicial reform, which was about the best I've ever heard, really motivates me and our organization. Uh, we have a lot of work to do, and we're grateful to have you on the front lines and advocating for justice and true equality. I am happy to be here today with all of you. Again, I wish it was in person. I am planning to come down for a reception with many of you where I can congratulate you in person um, on October 3rd, hopefully. And, uh, you know, I might just stay in Chicago if my White Sox managed to get in the playoffs. That would be a, a great time to be there. And so I want to take a moment to thank the Chicago Lawyer Chapter leadership. Thank you, Jeff, Rebecca Sundin, of course, for many years of work on this, Juan Thomas, Lauren Dana, Dan Cotter, Jerry Brown, and the entire Chicago ACS board. I want to thank all of you for your tremendous work. But as all the speakers have indicated, these are really harsh times. This past year has demonstrated in devastating detail just how much courts matter and who sits on them matters. As Camilla noted, there is no better example of this than the slew of legally unsound and dangerous decisions that were handed down by the Supreme Court in its last term. From Dobbs to Bruin to Carson, we're seeing just how power hungry this PAC Supreme Court is with six justices intent on imposing their extreme partisan agenda upon this country. Here's the hard truth about the Supreme Court that we have today. It was packed by the right to do exactly what it's doing. It's not going rogue, it's doing what it was expected to do. Handing down extremist decisions that are out of touch with the American people, disconnected from the constitution, and the factual history of this country, and that are very harmful to the lives of millions and millions of people. When we started advocating for SCOTUS reform last year, as Camilla pointed out, we were often met with resistance. I routinely had conversations with lawmakers who really weren't interested in talking about Supreme Court reform, either because they didn't see it as viable or they didn't see it as a priority. Well, these conversations are changing, particularly in the wake of Dobbs. Suddenly people want more information. They wanna understand what reform might look like and how it could be achieved legislatively. This shift from thinking of reform as a remote issue to thinking of it as a viable option and even a priority is in no small part thanks to ACS, we are proud to say. Our chapters across the country have been instrumental 
in talking about this, messaging this, advocating for Supreme Court reform and shaping the narratives in their states. And I wanna thank all of them for that. The Supreme Court decisions have also had the effect of spotlighting the enormous impact of state, state courts and who sits on them. As we know, when the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade, it sent the fate of abortion rights to the states for now, which ultimately means state, state courts. Already, lawsuits about abortion bans and related laws have been filed in more than a dozen states. Many states had trigger bans on the books ahead of Dobbs, which were set to ban abortion soon after Roe was overturned. In other states, legislation is being taken at, up. Right now, next door in Indiana, we saw the first state since Dobbs pass a near complete abortion ban. Lawyers, providers, and patients are desperately trying to figure out what the statute status of abortion rights is in their states and to retain abortion access for as long as possible. Many of you have been involved in strengthening and securing access for Illinois residents, and quite frankly, likely much of the Midwest. Your work will continue to be instrumental in this post-Dobbs America. Across the country, we are witnessing the importance of state judges who are committed to fundamental rights. In several states, judges are actually issuing injunctions to temporarily block state abortion bans and other laws impeding abortion access. Even if an injunction by a lower court is subsequently overturned for now, it still can enable a clinic to reopen temporarily and for at least some patients to access the health care they need. This is how critical it is that we have state court judges who believe in vindicating our fundamental rights. We at ACS believe that Dobbs will be overturned, but it will take years. And in the meantime, we will continue to see a barrage of lawsuits at the state level with state judges deciding the rights of pregnant people in their states. ACS is working to actively to identify and recruit diverse qualified judicial candidates for state courts. And we're committed to expanding how state level work works in the coming months and years. This work builds off of our existing and highly successful federal path to the bench project. The Biden-Harris administration's historic success in prioritizing judges is a credit to ACS's years of investing in our pipeline. Our 55 working groups across 42 states have built an unprecedented infrastructure for identifying and recommending diverse, qualified, progressive lawyers for the bench. We are in regular contact with the White House and the Senate about judicial candidates and vacancies. Our work's paying off. President Biden has had more federal judges confirmed at this point in his tenure than any president since John F. Kennedy. And President Biden's nominees and confirmed judges are also making history in their diversity, with a majority being women and people of color. We should all be proud of this administration's historic progress. If you support ACS, you have helped achieve President Biden's historic record on judges. We are committed to diversifying the federal and state judiciaries and to promoting judges who believe in vindicating fundamental rights. Today, this means abortion rights first and foremost, but it also means voting rights. And soon we could be having the same conversation about any number of substantive due process rights that the Supreme Court chooses to wipe out at the federal level. In states that elect judges, we are educating and mobilizing, vote, mobilizing voters about the importance of voting their full ballot, including races for state attorney general, secretary of state, and state court judges. I know I don't need to remind you about the importance of elections. This year, you will all be voting for a number of elected roles that are essential to securing and advancing substantive due process rights and essential to the continuing functioning of our democracy. We encourage you all to get involved on election day. Take our pledge to be a poll worker. Volunteer for election protection efforts. ACS has several great nonpartisan partnerships and we are happy to find a way for you to help. Email us or put us in the chat here if you're interested in learning more. 
I say this a lot, but I know it's true. ACS and our chapters across the country have never been more important than they are right now. The conservative legal movement had a multi-decade head start on prioritizing the courts, but ACS is making incredible gains, but it is a long-term, multi-year commitment to undo the damage of the rights package. We need each and every one of you. Your support is instrumental to the success of ACS and to the success of the progressive legal movement. I believe we will prevail in restoring the legitimacy of the Supreme Court in achieving a federal judiciary that reflects the diversity of the public it serves and in promoting a progressive vision of the law in which our laws and legal systems protect the lives of all people. We will prevail because our members and our supporters, because of the people joining this event. Now, for the real reason many of you have joined today, to celebrate some truly remarkable Chicago area advocates. Ruth Goldman and Abner J. Mikva were legends of our profession and serve as guides for so many of us who are committed to a progressive vision of the law. I think both would be really proud of today's recipients. We heard from the Ruth Goldman Award recipients, Alexa Van Brunt and Linda Coberly. Both have chosen to dedicate their talents and profession to attacking some Goliath level issues in the legal community. Alexa uses litigation to achieve de-incarceration, racial justice, and reform of the criminal legal system. She promotes accountability and transparency within the criminal legal system while also working to mentor the next generation of social justice advocates. Linda has worked tirelessly to advance the status of women. She co-chairs her firm's Women's Leadership Initiative. She has provided testimony crucial to the ratification of the ERA in Illinois, and she serves as the chair of the ERA Coalition's Legal Task Force. Chicago and the legal community are lucky to have Alexa and Linda's skill, advocacy, and energy. We'll soon hear about today's very deserving Abner J. Mikva Award recipient. Margaret Benson, Aziz Huck, and Mary Smith, who are no strangers to this legal community. Margaret has devoted her entire legal career to providing crucial free legal services to low-income families and individuals in Chicago. She also works to bring the Chicago legal community together by providing trainings to attorneys and connecting volunteer lawyers with clients in need. Of course, I've had the great pleasure of working with Aziz in his capacity as an ACS national board member, and I am thrilled to see him acknowledged for this award. Not only is he a scholar of the US in comparative constitutional law, he also publishes regularly in law review articles and major news outlets, working to provide guidance to the legal community and to everyday Americans on the courts and US constitutional law, and even maintains an active pro bono practice. And Mary is a trailblazer and has inspired so many to follow in her steps. She'll be the first female Native American president of the American Bar Association next year. She's also worked to bring about positive change, both in the private and public sectors, including in the Indian Health Service, the Illinois Department of Insurance, the DOJ, and in the White House. It is inspiring to think about the number of lives changed for the better by Margaret, Aziz, and Mary's great work. Thank you all for being here to celebrate and honor this progressive network and these legal legends. Thank you for your support, your activism, and your commitment to ACS. I'll now turn things over back again to Jeff. Thank you so much, Camilla and Russ. Um, we are very lucky to have these leaders in our community as we try to move forward in a very difficult time. Camilla has made, as we noted, an enormous difference in the realm of particularly um, gay and lesbian and transgender and so on rights. And uh, uh, Russ has done an extraordinary job in his role as ACS director and chair. So keep it up both of you. So let us turn now to our Abner J. Mikva Awards. In the history of this event over the past 20 years, we have recognized almost 60 legal legends. 
They include such esteemed figures as Ab Mikva, Newt Minow, Valerie Jarrett, James Montgomery, Ron Miller, Lowell Sackanoff, and Lori Lightfoot, to name just a few. In 2017, in honor of Ab Mikva, whose life and career exemplified in every way the model of an ACS legal legend, we renamed this award the Abner J. Mikva Award. It's now my great privilege to introduce these three recipients of the Mikva Award. Margaret Meg Benson received her law degree from Loyola in 1979. After working for a small law firm for a few years, she found her passion in 1982 when she joined Chicago Volunteer Legal Services as a staff attorney. She became de deputy director of CVLS a year later, and then in 2004, she became the organization's executive director. Over the years, CVLS has provided free legal services to tens of thousands of people living in poverty. Thanks to a small but dedicated staff and some 3,000 voluntary attorneys. An experienced litigator, Meg has spent years handling child custody, visitation, adoption, and guardianship litigation. She's an active member of the Illinois State Bar Association's Legislation Committee, where she has helped to draft and to lobby for guardianship and family law legislation. She co chaired the Chicago Bar Foundation's. Legal Aid Academy's Advisory Committee, and she is a member of the Board of Directors of the Women's Bar Association of Illinois. In addition, Meg speaks often on child custody and pro bono issues, and she writes a bi-monthly column on pro bono for the Chicago Lawyer. Meg's contributions have been widely recognized, including Loyola Law School's 2017 Public Service Merit Award, the Chicago Inn of Courts 2015 Donald Uber Public Service Award, the 2007 Illinois, Illinois State Bar Association's Board of Governors Award, and the 2001 Chicago Bar Foundation's Thomas H. Morris Public Service Award, to name just a few. She Meg, about the only award you haven't won is the Federalist Society Antonin Scalia Award for Constitutional Distortion. But that is not all. For Meg loves to compose dorky, songs, verses, and story parodies. As she told me, she can't help it because they just pop into her head. I will share just part of one of them. This goes to the tune of our favorite things. No one likes lawyers, we know you'll agree. But what if the lawyers do not charge a fee? That's what we do here, we're legal aid folks whose budget and clients are constantly broke. Our clients are poor and they're desperate for help. They haven't got money, no Hanukkah guilt. We give them free access to justice and then we do it again and again and again. Meg, come on up here as if they were here and sing us a song. I'm sorry, Jeff, I don't sing. I send, I give these to people to sing because you do not want to hear me. I don't, cannot carry a tune. Um, but anyway, thank you. Um, thank you very much for that lovely intro and for publishing sort of one of my songs because normally I just write them and they go into a, into a file and no one ever sees them. Um, I wanna also thank the Chicago chapter of the American Constitutional Society because I am so honored to be recognized by all of these distinguished people and honorees. I'm, um, I'm kind of in awe of this group um, for instance, I have been, I was exchanging emails with Jeff Stone, including fun emojis. I mean, I was sending emojis to Jeff Stone. I was just like, this is truly amazing to me because um, I don't usually travel in these higher circles. Um, I'm, and I'm, I'm totally honored that I'm receiving an award named for Abner Mikva, who was, as we all know, a giant in our profession. It's really humbling because I've spent my entire career basically at CVLS and, um, and I'm a family law lawyer at heart. I started out as a divorce lawyer. My clients don't have property or money to fight over. They usually fought over their kids and that's what I did. And I still love that work, but it's, um, I do feel very humbled by this group and this award. Um, I also do have to do a quick shout out to Jerry Brown 
who I know is an, a, fam a very good lawyer, <clears throat> very well known, and he's also a great law professor. In fact, he was one of my um, daughter's professors and she wanted me to say hi. But anyway, more importantly to me, Jerry is a great volunteer. He is an example of the kind of people who we get to volunteer for us who can make such a difference in the world. Um, so one of the reasons this award is so meaningful to me, I don't like talking about me and I, I feel like, but I love CVLS. And I think this award also reflects CVLS because we don't handle big cases. We don't do the work that Camilla does as much. I mean, we're so respectful of it and so happy that God knows she's out there doing it, but we don't do impact litigation or advocacy work. We represent low income individuals with legal problems. We handle, let's say small law. And I say that knowing that these cases are not small, they're huge to the people we're helping. What is bigger to a couple whose house is in foreclosure than to get a lawyer who finds flaws, serious flaws in the lender's case and defeats it. They keep their house. This is something that we do all the time. It's a big case. It's a very big case. And that's what makes me so proud. Um, we take the constitutional promises, the promises that the constitution itself prom uh, made, and then all the cases that come down from there, notwithstanding fairly recent changes, but we take these promises and we apply them for the individual people at the, at the circuit court level. And that's what I am so proud of it. We, pre we help these, these laws were created for the people and our volunteers are representing those people. Um, we make sure that as many people as possible can access the laws that everyone here is helping to protect. We recently, we put out a newsletter every month or two, and one of our, I think the current newsletter that's out there has a story from one of our volunteer attorneys who was helping, uh, someone came to him, he was being sued on a debt, or he had a, a longstanding debt, thousands and thousands of dollars. Our client really wasn't gonna be able to pay for that. And the, the vol I mean, the client, the volunteer found a violation of one of the federal debt collection laws. These, those laws were there to protect clients, but our clients don't know how to do that. And the lenders, they know those laws are there and to the best of their ability, they will ignore them or get around them. But our volunteer found it, filed in court, dealt with it, debt is wiped out. That makes me so, so very proud. We represent homeowners. We re represent children and our children have rights to be safe and protected, but they also, their parents have rights to have access to their children. We, a lot of our volunteers who represent children in contested custody cases manage to navigate it so that the children are safe and protected and the parents can, and they spend time with their parents because these families are important, an important unit, but a lot of times there's problems. And we have volunteers who put so much time and trouble into navigating the, um, the issues between parents and making sure the children have their parents in their lives and yet are safe and protected. We bring the laws that are safe for everyone, that are written for everyone to poor people in Chicago. And that makes me so proud. And I also have to say the other thing about my job that I love and why I don't think I deserve awards because this is too much of a fun job is because I love our volunteers. We have around 3000 volunteer attorneys like Jerry Brown and some of the other people who are watching this. And they do, I get paid for my job, but they don't. These people are helping. They spend a lot of time and a lot of talent making sure our clients get the services they need and they deserve. They're doing it for free just from the, because they're good people. And it's a wonderful job to be always able to work with really good people. I wanna thank you again. I'm really honored. I have to also have to thank my husband, Art Simon, who's watching at another computer two rooms away on his work computer. I wanna thank my three daughters who were raised at CVLS and still consider it their own, uh, Julia, Caroline, and Gina. None of them are watching right now because they're either at work or um, traveling actually, because they travel, I don't. 
And I want to thank my CVLS people. I love my people at CVLS. We have incredibly dedicated staff. And again, this is really all of us. I am just one person in an amazing organization. So thank you all. And um, I'm very honored. Thank you. Thank you, Meg. Um, you do enormously important work. Um, and I think maybe, you know, you should think about forming a new organization, um, the American Society uh, for People Who Help People. Um, and maybe you could even sing to them. So our next Mikva Award recipient is my colleague at the University of Chicago Law School, Aziz Huck. Aziz earned his JD from Columbia and then served as a law clerk to Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Over the next several years, Aziz had a series of fellowships, including among others, a Carnegie Scholars Fellowship to study the challenges faced by Muslim minorities in North America and Europe, and a National Science Foundation Fellowship to do empirical research concerning Muslims in the US and the UK. Aziz joined the faculty of the University of Chicago Law School in 2009, and he currently holds the Frank and Bernice J. Greenberg professorship. In recent years, Aziz has served as a cooperating counsel for the ACLU of Illinois, Muslim Advocates, and director of the Brennan Center's Liberty and National Security Project, among many other public service activities. Aziz is a truly extraordinarily productive and influential scholar. He has published several remarkable books, including Unchecked and Unbalanced, Presidential Power in a Time of Terror, How to Save a Constitutional Democracy, and the Collapse of Constitutional Remedies. He's also published some 75 scholarly articles in all of the most prestigious journals in our nation, including pieces on discriminatory policing, the private suppression of constitutional rights, and the counter-democratic difficulty. On top of that, Aziz has published roughly 25 book chapters, including the Supreme Court and the dynamics of democratic backsliding, democracies near misses, and winning without the courts. As you can see from these examples, Aziz is not only unbelievably prolific, but also one of our nation's leading voices in support of all that ACS stands for. It should come as no surprise then that ACS, that Aziz is a member of the National Board of the American Constitution Society. While doing all of this, Aziz has continued to work on litigation matters close to his heart. To cite just three examples, he worked with the Center for Constitutional Rights on a federal court challenge to the New York Police Department's practice of spying on Muslim Americans. With the ACLU of Illinois on a challenge to stop and frisk practices in Chicago. And on a challenge to Facebook's policies with regard to hate speech. Aziz has told me that his most proud moment from legal practice was when his report on the Afghan constitution making process was published. And the UN mission was so upset by his revelations that he was banned from all UN grounds. Aziz, not only do we not ban you, but we welcome you with open minds and open arms. Congratulations. Thank you, Jeff, for that uh, very kind uh, introduction. Uh, uh, everyone should know that I have the office next door to Jeff, uh, and therefore he has a, a vested neighborly interest in being um, being kind in that way. Uh, I'm really grateful to Rebecca and her colleagues on the Chicago chapter, our uh, lawyers chapter of uh, the ACS, uh, to Peggy and her colleagues at National ACS, uh, and in particular to Russ for his leadership, not just uh, today, but uh, through these several difficult years in uh, the, uh, at the, at the, in the cockpit of uh, the national organization. Uh, all of your work has been important and um, inspiring. I'm very sorry that uh, we're not together in person um, to celebrate that work. Um, it's an enormous honor to be uh, an AMPA J. Mikva honoree. Um, I did not know Judge uh, Mikva uh, except uh, through his uh, reputation uh, at the helm of 
each of the three branches of our national government. Uh, and, and, it's, and it's not just deeply touching, but also a little discomforting uh, to receive an award that allows one to bask obliquely and in reflection in the enormous achievements and incontrovertible contributions to American rights and democracy that Judge Mikva uh, stands for. It feels a little bit like stealing a bit of his uh, glory uh, to have his uh, name associated with mine. So to mitigate uh, the, the sense of uh, a, a filched uh, achievement, um, I, I spent some time looking through uh, the archives of, of tributes and celebrations of Judge Mikva's life uh, and work. And I, I was looking for something that uh, connected uh, the work that he did with, with some of the things uh, that I have done uh, in the past. Um, and and I, I want to draw your attention to one small uh, anecdote about uh, Judge Mikva's uh, work and life uh, that uh, links to some of the work that I have done in the past and continue to do now. So uh, as Jeff mentioned, in the early 2000s, I, I spent some time working for a, uh, a group called Crisis Group uh, on uh, the quality of democracy in several emerging post-conflict societies uh, like Afghanistan and uh, Sri Lanka. Um, and more recently, I've spent time thinking about the way in which the quality of our democracy in the United States turns upon and is linked to uh, the quality of uh, democracy around the world. As many people know, uh, we're uh, globally experiencing a recession in the quality of democracy. And there are important both uh, causal links and political connections between the dynamics of failing democracy in other countries and the pressures that are being placed on our democratic institutions, uh, obviously uh, in, uh, instantiated in the January 6, 2021 uh, insurrectionary violence, but also evident at other times. There's also connections between that and what's happening overseas. Now, as usual, uh, what I want to point out is Judge Mikva was ahead of the curve. So in, in 2004, a year that I was working for the crisis group in Pakistan and Nepal on the quality of their democracies, Judge Mikva happened to be in uh, a small uh, Eastern European country called Ukraine, not one that, that uh, receives much attention these days. Judge Mikva was working as an election observer in one of the first elections that Ukraine had had uh, since becoming or since peeling away from the Soviet Union. Uh, he was at a local polling station uh, uh, where he thought something was awry with the way that ballots were being uh, taken up and, and carried away. And so he followed uh, a set of ballots back from the polling station to where they were supposed to be counted. Uh, and saw that there were stashes of ballots being been taken away uh, to one side. No doubt this may, may have reminded him of his early days in Chicago politics. But Judge Mikva uh, protested loudly and long at the way in which democracy, whether it was taking place uh, in, uh, in, 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 in the Windy City or in Kiev, was, uh, was being uh, accomplished. So I think that we should take Judge Mikva's insight here to heart. We should see that, that the health of our democracy, the way the democracy that he fought so hard uh, for, uh, is linked uh, in, in many ways to the fate of democracies around the world. And we would do well to understand the pressures that are, all, that are being placed on those democracies and the way those, those pressures are filtering in and manifesting in our own uh, nation. If, my work contributes just a little bit to that larger project, a project for which Judge Mick fought, both on the home front and overseas, I would be very pleased. Thank you very much again, and I'm deeply honored to receive this award. Thank you, Aziz. Um, 
you clearly deserve this award. Um, and I look forward to seeing all that you accomplish uh, as you go forward. A final award recipient this afternoon is Mary Smith. Mary has worked in many areas of the legal profession, including government and private practice. She's had a very diverse career, but one theme that pervades all of her work is her determination to make a difference and to help people. I'll start at the beginning and in full disclosure, Mary was a student of mine at the University of Chicago Law School, graduating in 1991. As Mary recently reminded me, she received the highest grade in my evidence class. I therefore like to think that I can take full credit for all of her work as a trial attorney. After law school, Mary clerked for Federal Court of Appeals Judge Arlen E. Anderson in Macon, Georgia. After returning to Chicago from her clerkship, Mary joined the firm of Ross and Hardy's. And in addition to her full plate of commercial litigation matters, she wanted to do more. As a second year associate, Mary took on one of the first cases under the then new Illinois hate crimes law. She brought a civil case representing a gay man who had been injured by three young men because of his sexual orientation. Although it was notoriously hard in those days to recover any monetary damages in such a situation, Mary persevered and was able to gain recovery for a client and to help him move forward in his life. Later, during the Clinton administration, Mary worked both at the US Department of Justice and at the White House. In the White House, Mary worked on issues such as equal pay for women, domestic violence, civil rights, and Native American issues. Mary, by the way, is a tribal member of the Cherokee Nation. Later in her career, Mary worked at Skadden Arps. While there, she represented several members of Congress, including then Speaker Dick Gephardt and Congressman Jim Clyburn in the University of Michigan Law School's affirmative action case. Fast forward to what Mary is doing now, and just last week, she was installed as president-elect of the American Bar Association. She is the first Native American woman to hold its role in the ABA's almost 150 year history. Mary plans to focus on advancing democracy and the rule of law and promoting diversity, equity, and inclusion. Clearly, there is much work to do these days on all of those fronts. So it is my honor to welcome my amazing former student for her remarks, which no doubt will be first in the class. Mary. Thank you so much, Professor Stone, for that kind introduction. And as I told him, never in my wildest imagination did I think he would ever be introducing me rather than the other way around. Um, and you certainly, yes, take full credit. Um, I have attended this luncheon in the past and never thought I would be an honoree. So I wanna thank you so much to the American Constitution Ch Chicago Lawyer Chapter um, and to um, all my fellow honorees. I'm so humbled to receive this award, particularly as I had the honor and privilege of personally knowing Judge Mikva and calling him a friend. As a young man, Judge Mikva tried to volunteer to help the Democrats and was told by a ward boss, we don't want nobody, nobody sent, pointing the immortal distillation of political cronyism. Judge Mikva wore the mantle of that nobody, nobody sent title proudly because it meant he was independent. It meant he was guided by the law and the facts. It meant he was guided by justice and honor. It meant he was guided by transparency. I think it's fitting that we're meeting here in the summer of 2022. This summer, we have seen the January 6th hearings work to undercover the facts and bring transparency to the events of the horrendous attack on our democracy and the peaceful transfer of power. Almost 50 years ago, this nation was also transfixed by televised hearings as well. In a perfect storm of unlikely circumstances, Barbara Jordan, a junior Congresswoman from Houston, Texas, who grew up in segregation, landed a prime time spot to deliver an opening statement on July 25, 1974, during President Richard Nixon's impeachment hearings. We, the people, said Barbara Jordan, it is a very eloquent beginning, but when the document was completed on the 17th of September, 1787, 
I was not included in We the People. I felt somehow for many years that George Washington and Alexander Hamilton just left me out by mistake. But through the process of amendment, interpretation, and court decision, I have finally been included in We the People. The audience was riveted. I was riveted. I was a young girl. I did not know anything about the law. I did not know anything about impeachment, and I certainly did not know anything about Congress. But there was one thing I did know. I knew I needed to listen to this woman. I knew she had substance. I knew she was saying something important. Barbara Jordan emphasized during her remarks, my faith in the Constitution is whole. It is complete. It is total. I am not going to sit here and be an idle spectator to the diminution, the subversion, the destruction of the Constitution. And that is what the American Constitution Society does. It helps to educate about the Constitution and breathes life and transparency to its meaning. That is the very essence of its name, the American Constitution Society. The mission of ACS is that it believes the Constitution is of the people, by the people, and for the people. Both ACS and the American Bar Association have a shared goal to advance the rule of law and to promote democracy. We as lawyers have an important, and I'll say indeed central role in keeping democracy alive. We are the keepers of democracy. And that is why the American Constitution Society work is so important. So thank you so much for what you all do every day and keep doing it. It is important and noble work. It is not always easy, particularly in our polarized political world. And if I can leave you with just one thought, please do not be idle spectators. So thank you so much again, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. I look forward to learning from you in the future, and I'm sure there will be much to learn. And that brings our festivities to a close. I'd like to thank our honorees, our board, our sponsors, and all of our attendees today. Most of all, though, we want to bring us back to reality. This is not a time to sit back and relax. This is a time to work hard to figure out how to move forward towards a world that our children and our children's children will want to live in. This is truly a test of our commitment to what we say we believe. ACS will lead the way. If you are not yet a dues paying member, I urge you to become one now. As that Mick for once said at this luncheon about ACS, don't just stand there, join us. There's the people in this room and the people like us across the nation who must work now to save our democracy. This is not a time to underestimate the danger. It is real, it is clear, and it is present. Thank you. <laughs>